Uh, I am Amy Atwater again. I'm the Paleontology Collections Manager and Registrar at Museum of the Rockies. Today we're going to be talking um, so about Museum of the Rockies. We are located in Bozeman, Montana, uh, which is um, a South Central in Montana. We are north of Wyoming and south of uh, the Canadian border. So when you zoom in, you will uh, see uh, where we are on this map that we are just north of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so that is a, one of our many claim to fames. Another one, of course, is our fossils and including Big Mike. Big Mike is a bronze um, Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton uh, statue that is on will greet you at Museum of the Rockies when you visit us when we reopen again when it is safe. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, dinosaurs, kind of, but mostly in the terms of the fossil record and how we understand the relative ages of the fossil record and how we, how we date the fossil record, which we're not going to be talking about how to ask a dinosaur to prom. It's not that kind of dating. We're trying to figure out how old uh, different fossils are or different events or different periods of the Earth's history and how we study that. So here you can see a drawing on the right of a simplified geologic time scale um, that is depicting the Earth's layers of rocks. Um, so the geologic time scale is a system of chronological dating that relates uh, geologic strata, which are the layers that you see, uh, to time. So we have an actual the exact number of years ago. Uh, this method of uh, the geologic time scale is not only used for paleontologists, but also by a lot of geologists and a lot of other earth scientists. And it helps us understand uh, not only the timing, but also the relationship of events that have occurred in earth's history and see if there's any correlation or causation between these events and the timing of them. Uh, so the fossil record, as you can see, is divided up into lots of different time periods, all of which try to encapsulate earth's 4.6 billion year history. Uh, and for example, a popular one, of course, are the dinosaurs. So um, dinosaurs are from the uh, age of dinosaurs, which is also known as the Mesozoic era, which ranges from about 252 million years ago to about 66 million years ago. Uh, 66 million years ago is, one of, is when one of the most famous events in Earth's history occurred. Uh, which is the end of the age of the dinosaurs when an asteroid hit the earth and that along with some other pretty bummer things that were happening on earth like a lot of volcanic eruptions uh, caused a ginormous extinction event and all non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. So all dinosaurs except for the birds went extinct at this time. What's cool about this is we know that this happened 66.021 million years ago which for something that's 66 billion years ago, it seems pretty crazy that we can get it to be so precise. I don't even necessarily remember what I had for dinner yesterday, and yet we can figure out how old an event happened 66 million years ago. You may be asking yourself, how do we know this? How can we get it down to such a precise level of detail to be able to understand uh, that dinosaurs and a lot of other organisms went extinct 66.021 million years ago. So the way that we understand that is by using tools and um, the tools that we use to understand the age of fossils or significant events in the fossil record are referred to relative and absolute dating. So these two methods, uh, this diagram depicts it pretty well. Relative dating just tends to tell us what it is older relative to something else. Uh, and it uh, doesn't necessarily have an exact number of years. Absolute dating is going to be more precise than that and allows us to put an actual number, um, always with an error, of course, too. We're always going to calculate some error when calculating these. Uh, and that is what we're able to actually put those numbers next to, like the 66.021. Uh, so the first one we're going to be talking about today is relative dating. And this is one of the older ways that we as paleontologists have understood the history of, Earth, of life on Earth. Uh, so with relative dating, we need to get into some of the fundamentals of geology and some of the principles of geology, if you will. And one of those principles is the law of superposition. 
And this essentially says that in any undisturbed sequence of rocks, the oldest layer is always going to be on the bottom and the youngest layer is always going to be on the top. Uh, so you can kind of think about this. I don't know if you're like me, you don't always keep your room really clean and you might have a big old pile of laundry gathering or dirty clothes lather gathering up on the floor. Well, that article of clothing that's on the very bottom is what you wore the longest ago, right? That was the coldest article of clothing. The article of clothing that those socks that are thrown on top, those you threw there yesterday and they're the youngest. So when you look at your room, when you're cleaning up your room, you can be practice your own paleontological skills of figuring out what is older than the other one and uh, relating these events because of that. Uh, so we really, or you can also think about cake. Uh, if you think about having a nice delicious layer cake, uh, you always have to make the cake that's on the bottom first and then you add the other cakes on top. And so that's a delicious way and less of a, a, a dirty room way to keep track of that. But that's really what we do a lot of in paleontology. If you were to go to a site and find a big old dinosaur skeleton, you would know that, and, and then maybe on top of, and then on other rocks, you might have um, like a mammoth fossil. Well, you're going to find the dinosaur skeleton underneath the mammoth skeleton, and that's because it's older. Uh, and deposited there older, which might even happen here in Montana where we do get both dinosaurs and really cool mammals, but usually they're divided by a lot of rock. Okay, so one of the tools that we use to understand relative dating are called index fossils. So index fossils are fossils that are used to identify um, geologic time periods. Uh, and so a lot of times they're invertebrates. Uh, so things that don't have a backbone, but maybe have a shell, like the shells that you see here, or the nice spirals of ammonites are very popular, or trilobites are also very um, commonly used for index fossils. So what index fossils have to be is that they have to have a very short vertical range. So they couldn't, they cannot have persisted very long in the fossil record but they have a wide geographic distribution. So they existed for a short amount of time, but covered a lot of ground. And they had these rapid evolutionary trends. So you can see the changes in form and know that things are older or younger. So I was trying to think of a way that we could explain this with uh, humans and human culture. And I was talking to my fiance about the landfill and how if you were to go to a landfill and you were to dig through all that trash there, you might start to find items that tell you about how old that trash was thrown in there. Say if you found a bunch of CDs and a bunch of CD players. Well, we don't really use CD players anymore. And uh, in the 80s, uh, we didn't have CDs yet either. So if you found a bunch of CDs in your uh, landfill, then you might know just by finding a bunch of those that you're dealing with a time period that's from the 1990s or the early 2000s. Maybe if you dig deeper into that, uh, into that landfill or archeological site, find a record player. And then you know that you are in an even older amount of the landfill there because we don't use record players any, well, we do, but not nearly as common as we used to and not like we used to use CDs as well. Uh, so those aren't perfect examples because some of that technology still exists, whereas these fossil forms literally go extinct. Uh, but that is just a way to kind of think about, hey, how do we use the clues of what we're finding to understand the relative ages? And that's what the relative dating system is really all about. And now we really need this because um, why do we need to have these um, index fossils? And that really comes down to the fact that there is no other place on earth, uh, there's no place on earth whatsoever that has a continuous stack of all of the rocks in earth's history right? Even the Grand Canyon, we have so much rock preserved there, but it's still not all of the layers of the rocks or, uh, his, of the Earth's history. So we need to use things like index fossils, which could be found in faraway places, to help us tie the relative ages of these rock units together. So here in this diagram, you're looking at a strat column or layer of rocks from Montana and Texas. And the different, the number of layers is not the same in these. 
uh, but they do have the same index fossils in them. So we can understand the relative ages of these units, even across major state boundaries or even around the world too. Uh, a lot of marine and um, invertebrates are used and are very helpful for understanding global timing of uh, different events. So that's really the basics of, of relative dating. It's uh, understanding what fossils are going to be indicative of certain time periods and being able to isolate those fossils and correlate them to other known uh, strat columns where we can figure that out too. So that is a, the essence of uh, relative dating. Now we're going to jump into some of the absolute dating, though I might pause here if we have any, if, if you need me to, Jamie, or if I should dive into absolute fossils next, absolute dating. Do we have any questions at this point, team? Now would be a good time to ask Amy. Or not. We'll have time at the end. Cool. Okay, because now we're going to jump into some of the heavier stuff, all right? So now we're going to start discussing our uh, absolute dating. So with absolute dating, now we're talking about putting a precise number of years next to um, an event or a fossil or uh, something in that regard. So um, one of those ways is called magnetostatigraphy. It's what's here on the left. We're going to talk about that one first and then we're going to talk next about radiometric dating. So first we're going to focus on magnetostatigraphy. Whew, all right, let's jump in. Now we're going to get into a lot of other disciplines. So magnetostatigraphy all has to do with taking advantage of magnetic minerals and Earth's magnetic field to determine the age for a sequence of rocks. So the Earth generates a magnetic field that encompasses the entire planet and includes both a north and a south pole. That you can see here on this diagram. You can see this compass in the middle of the Earth and all of these rounding out parts. That is that magnetic field, which are terminating in either the north or the south pole. Now, what is a little out there to think about is that at unpredictable intervals, the Earth has experienced geomagnetic reversals. That means the North and the South Poles have actually traded places. It's like trading places, that TV show, but instead of houses, it's the poles. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that we do not fully understand why and how it happens yet too. So if that's one of your questions, I will ask you to go ask a physicist. But essentially how this pertains to fossils and dating the rock record, it has, to, it has to do with when these rocks are actually forming. Uh, because these uh, reversals, these geomagnetic reversals that I just talked about, the switch of the North and South Pole, that has happened uh, many, many times over the Earth's history in its recorded archaeological history in the rocks. So this happens uh, when rocks form, magnetic minerals within the rock will align to the Earth's magnetic field during deposition and record whether the magnetic field is normal or if it's in a stage of being reversed. Okay, so essentially like um, basalt uh, forming at the bottom of this, the ocean uh, coming out of seafloor vents there. Now basalt has got a lot of iron in it, which is um, naturally magnetic. And so those iron minerals within the basalt are going to literally form and crystallize at an orientation depending on how the poles are uh, either normal or reversed. And that's what we're looking for. So what we end up doing is uh, we, since these reversals are occurring at fairly sporadic, irregular intervals, uh, that means the periods of time in which they're recorded leave behind a pattern that is extremely unique. It is like a barcode-like fingerprint. And that is because these reversals are happening at such a not timed manner that the record in the rock is a completely new barcode unique code. And it's unique at a global scale. 
And because these reversals are unique and on a global scale, they make really excellent tools for dating the fossil record because paleontologists can then compare and correlate the measured magnet so you go and take a bunch of samples. So in the photo on the right here is where um, geologists or paleontologists have taken core samples from these rocks. And so what they're doing is they're sampling the rocks in the field, taking them to a lab, analyzing them to see what the polarity is to create a chart like you see in the middle here. The dark versions of the, the dark parts of this graph are when the poles are normal polarity and the white sections are when they're reversed polarity. So what you can do from a field area is you can collect enough samples to then be able to compare and correlate the measured str stratigraphic chart of the magnetic reversals to the known global chart. And then all of a sudden, because we know the exact age of the global chart, you know at your local region how old the site is where you were sampling those rocks. So. It is complicated. It has a lot to do uh, with, um, again, understanding how the Earth's magnetic fields change, uh, but it is a very powerful tool in paleontology and it is very, very handy and is, uh, I have not myself done any magnetostatigraphy work, but we do as paleontologists still actively use this as a method to understand how old our rocks are and figure out what the absolute age at these specific events that we are recorded with the polarity. Okay, that was magnetostatigraphy. A really fancy word too. It's really just like using the magnets and rocks to understand the layers of your rocks. That was not as eloquent. Amy, how would a magnetic reversal affect us? That is such a, ah, oh, that's a fantastic question. How would a magnetic reversal affect us? Well, there's some uh, that is, there's some, uh, it, it could be happening on such a fast or slow time scale that it's uh, like unperceivable, imperceivable for us. Cause we, you can also get magnetic wandering where it's not a full reversal necessarily, uh, but you do get variations in the Earth's magnetic field and physicists are still trying to understand if these are in fact full-blown reversals happening and we just don't have the technology to really grasp that yet. Um, or if we haven't actually experienced a reversal yet as human beings and being here for fairly short amount of time compared to Earth's 4.6 billion year history. Uh, so there's a lot to be said that we don't really know how it would affect humans or if it has already happened and we it hasn't really affected us because we don't even necessarily know how to quantify that at this point. Excellent question. Sorry, I don't have a more precise answer. Is it possible that solar flares affect magnetic reversal? Mm. That is a fantastic question and I would assume that once we are outside of just our earth environment we really do need to look at our solar system as a whole to be um, uh, able to understand how uh, these things are affecting earth at a larger solar system level so there's definitely the potential for uh, the solar flares uh, because we also have a bunch of other cycles that happen um, it, that are called the milankovitch cycles uh, in paleontology and they are pretty uh, they're patterned, um, we can measure when they're going to occur and why they occur, and it all has to do with astronomy, essentially, and how the Earth is rotating around the sun and uh, how, oh, a lot of things that I have not covered in detail in many, many, many years. So fascinating ideas out there. I am not sure. I would love to do some more research on solar flares and how that affects magnetostatigraphy. All right, that's all we've got for now. Thank you. Ooh, good questions. Okay. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to chat about is the last part that we're chatting about today is radiometric dating. Uh, so uh, this is when we date um, either a geological or archaeological sample or specimen, and we actually uh, measure the relative proportions of a particular radioactive isotope present in the sample. Uh, for example, this one 
Uh, this one here is showing uh, carbon. So this is something that must be organic that has been dated using carbon-14 radiometric dating. Uh, this is a very common method for dating organic material, and it has to be less than at least 50,000 years old. And we're going to talk about that because of isotopes. Yes. Okay, so we just talked about, you have to look at the different proportions of, uh, of the isotopes present in a sample to be able to use radiometric dating. So what's an isotope? All right, isotopes are elements that have the same number of protons in their nucleus, but a different number of neutrons. So having the same number of protons mean that they're still the same element, like you're looking all at hydrogen here, different um, isotopes of hydrogen in this example. Uh, but, but since they have a different number of neutrons, then we are, uh, that is what is uh, making it an isotope. Now, isotopes can either be stable or they can be unstable. And unstable isotopes are radioactive. That's what we call radioactive. Uh, and it's essentially that uh, un uh, instability that is causing them to be radioactive. Uh, whereas stable isotopes do not break down. They are stable. They can stay in their form. Uh, where, uh, in, and so they won't break down into other isotopes or even other elements. Whereas unstable isotopes, the radioactive ones, will actually decay by ejecting their neutrons and sometimes their protons from their nucleus and actually will either become a different isotope or will become a totally different element if they're getting rid of some of those protons. And what is great about this uh, and different than magnetostatigraphy is that this Unstable isotope decay is happening at a constant measurable rate. Now, constant here does not mean linear. Uh, it means um, it's actually exponential rate, but it is something that we can measure and predict. And therefore, it is a extremely, extremely useful tool if we know how these decay and can measure what they decay into. So, that uh, the decay rate is different for different isotopic systems. It's different from the, uh, the hydrogen that you'd see here. It's different for the carbon. And it's different because of half-life. So now we're going into even more chemistry here about what is in half-life. So a half-life is how long it takes for 50% of the unstable parent isotope that you, we tend to call the unstable state, the original state, the parent isotope, and what it uh, decays into the daughter isotope. Uh, so that is, it takes how long, the half-life is how long it takes for 50% of the unstable parent isotope to decay into the stable daughter product. So you can see I have um, an hourglass here. It's got uranium lead in it, for example, but you can think of it just like an hourglass. How long does it take for half of that sand to go through the hourglass? That would be your half-life. Now, different isotope systems have different half-lives, which makes them more or less applicable for different needs in paleontology. So for example, we just talked about carbon-14. Uh, so carbon-14 is radioactive and it decays into nitrogen over time. It has a half-life of about 5.7 thousand years. So this means that it's useful for dating, but it needs to be dating um, younger things because it, after 5.7, after a certain amount of time, there won't be enough of that parent isotope to measure anymore. And so because of this, C14 is not useful for dating deposits that are older than about 30,000 years old. You would not use carbon dating to date a dinosaur site because as we talked about at the beginning, dinosaurs go extinct 66, except for birds, 66 million years ago. Um, Another common one is potassium argon. This is using feldspars and volcanic rocks. This has a much longer half-life, so you can use it to date uh, a lot of fossil things, um, anything that is older than about 100,000 years. Another really common one is uranium lead. Uh, uranium lead is used um, for dating a lot of times zircons in volcanic or sedimentary rocks. And it uh, also has a very, very, very long half-life. So that means it's even better for dating older things and it is not good for dating younger things. So you need to know your sample uh, to know what method to use. 
And for an example, uh, to end up here, I'm going to talk about an example that from a uh, publication that I published recently in the Journal of Paleontology Electronica on dating this fossil site. So you can see here this beautiful hill showing a stack of sedimentary rocks and you know what? Some of these uh, sedimentary rocks have fossils in them like this primate skull. Now we know because primates are in North America during the Eocene that relatively this is in the Eocene, but we weren't sure of the precise age. Fortunately, the, fossil, the layer with the fossils in it was between layers of volcanic ash from a nearby volcano. And we were able to use uranium lead dating of zircon crystals that were collected from those ash layers formed in that volcano erupting uh, and uh, records the, uh, that age of that volcanic eruption by trapping in that uranium into that zircon crystal. So um, by dating these ashes, we found that the, the one on the bottom was about 44.5 uh, million years old. The one on top is about 42.8 million years ago. So we know, again, by the relative method that we talked about first, that that fossil needs to be somewhere in between those two ash layers. And through more calculations and a lot of scientific study, uh, we were able to actually calculate the age of the deposition of that fossil to be 43.7 million years old, thanks to both relative and absolute dating. So today we've talked a lot about some very um, uh, advanced scientific topics and concepts, uh, but to reiterate some of the main points is that we need, uh, that paleontologists need to use both relative and absolute dating to understand the relative ages of fossils and absolute ages, and to be able to understand the timing of significant events. Uh, relative dating helps us understand older versus younger, utilizing index fossils. And uh, absolute dating helps us understand the exact uh, age in a number of years. Uh, magnetostatigraphy is relying on the Earth's magnetic field, whereas radiometric dating is relying on the proportions of radioactive isotopes, as we discussed. So if you want to go date a dinosaur, and again, find out how old it is, not take it to the movies, uh, then you're going to need to use not carbon dating, and you're, need, you're going to need to use a method that, is, uh, that can span the time frame that you are interested in. So choosing the most appropriate method depends on your setting in paleontology. And you really, it really depends on the relative age that you're working in, what type of rocks are present, and what kind of options you have uh, applicable for you. But I hope as you continue out in your journey uh, to learn more about paleontology, you will come across some of these words and know a little bit more about what's going on. So uh, thank you for your time today. And a little shout out for next week, we're doing our Fossil Friday event on paleohistology, which is looking inside the dinosaur bones. So. Thank you so much. Hopefully we have some time for questions. We do. Amy just gave you a ton of information. What questions do you have for her? We're all still processing, I think. Uh, just minds are blown. I mean, I hope that there, I hope that it was able to that everyone was able to follow the general topics. Uh, uh, but I'd all, I've always kind of want to put together now, I think it'd be really funny to make a fake dating app that would essentially show you different fossils and you'd have to decide what, what dating technique would be the most applicable to date that fossil. Um, like if you had a mammoth, you couldn't choose argon argon or you couldn't choose uranium lead, you'd have to select the carp. It would just be a fun way to, uh, that was an idea I had and then I did not put that together for this. So I apologize all to everyone. We can also talk about dinosaurs. If you have general dinosaur questions, I can generally help with that too. <laughs> we have a question about whether you can see the North and the South Pole move? Uh, yes. So I guess that they, they can move on human time scales and the way that we know that they're moving has to do with, um, oh goodness. 
trying to think of that exact example of it. I know that they uh, have been recorded in some regard. We don't understand entirely how they are changing or when they are going to. Uh, but man, I think you're going to have to ask your geophysics friend a little bit more for that information. Unfortunately, I don't have a direct answer for you off the top of my off the top of my head. That's okay. What other types of dating are there besides the kind that you showed us today? So one of the ones that I had on there, rubidium. rubidium. So rub, rubidium strontium dating is actually what we use to know that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and it's literally dating these minerals that were found on um, uh, achondritic meteorites. So we were actually using essentially space rocks and looking at rubidium strontium decay uh, to be able to understand the very, very ancient age of the earth. Uh, so there are quite a few other methods out there. There's also, um, um, I mean, not only potassium argon, but there's also argon argon is another dating method. Um, and then there are some really minerals and elements that I can't even pronounce sometimes. So um, lutetium and hafnium. Oh gosh. And then isn't there also um, hydrogen, helium? There are a lot. It, uh, so the ones I've used personally are uranium lead. So the ages of the fossils that I've been interested in, that has been, I should also mention that how you process these ages can vary widely by the amount of time needed. So I've done techniques um, here in Montana and in Texas using uranium lead that we were able to use an LC, uh, use very fancy lab equipment. Um, so one of the reasons I like using uranium lead is you can have a result relatively quickly. If you're doing something like argon argon, it literally needs to take at least two years to run the analysis because of the inherent nature of the study. So I did not go into that today, but they all have different requirements in the lab as well that are going to play a role as a researcher, which one you choose or which one you can choose if you have a choice about to pursue. So there's a lot to study about dating. Yes, and you know what? Most people who study geochronology do not use it just for fossils. They are answering questions about large-scale tectonic events like mountains uprising and rivers, uh, the drainage patterns of rivers. Uh, so we are but a very tiny part of what the method, these methods are actually used for. So um, if you are really into the physics, into the chemistry, into the rocks, uh, then there are all sorts of avenues and different questions that I'm not very familiar with as a paleontologist that use this type of science as really informative and exciting tools. Great. Michael Walls is wondering what the most current thought about the plastic effect flexible, plastic flexible material found in dinosaur bones. Oh, are we talking about like um, tendons and cartilage preserving those sorts of aspects? Um, we, we have finally had some soft tissue that has been preserved in dinosaurs. And actually there are a few studies that came out in the last couple months that aren't true full-blown DNA present yet, but there's DNA markers like chromosome staining that's present in some of the cartilage that's being preserved in these dinosaur fossils or in some cases in soft tissues and ambers. Uh, and so, man, this last year we did make a bunch of major steps from not only having actual soft tissue preserved, but now we're being able to actually differentiate and understand what that different soft tissue is. And we're getting, I hate, I can't even believe I'm saying it, but it sounds like we're getting closer and closer to actually securing DNA from a dinosaur. So maybe, don't hold me to that. <laughs> All right, and before we go, remind us how long dinosaurs have been extinct. So dinosaurs have been extinct for 66 million years, except for birds. Birds are descendant of the dinosaurs. And man, when I see turkeys walking around my neighborhood, I see the connection. I see it. 
Anyway, <laughs> uh, but non-avian dinosaurs all went extinct um, at the end of the age of dinosaurs 66 million years ago at an event we call the KPG boundary. All right. Any last burning questions today? My favorite dinosaur is Therizinosaurus. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, friends, we look forward to seeing you back here next week at 1210 to join our friend Ellen and look inside dinosaur bones and take a look at her histology lab. If you want to prep for that event, go ahead and Google what is histology. And we'll see you then. Have a great day. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Bye, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for the learning. Yay. <laughs>